So next presentation is by Dr. Umapati Hegde, who was our own student and now the vice chairman of our department. So uh, he is going to speak on transplant renal artery stenosis. So Uma, please go ahead and make your presentation. Uma, you have to unmute yourself. I can see your slides, but can't hear you. I can't see your. Mapati, I can't see your slide, but maybe. No, no. Sir, we can see the slides. We can okay. see slides. There's some problem with my thing, maybe. Okay, sir. <laughs> Fine. I can see it also. I'm going to say some uh, post transplant and the etiology of the diagnosis of the hypertension is an important thing. We all know that the blood pressure control is an important factor in reducing complications. And if the blood pressure is very well controlled, even in chronic kidney disease and even after transplant, the transplant outcome is good. Transplant renal artery stenosis is an important vascular complication after the transplant, and it is a curable form of hypertension. If you diagnose it early and treat it effectively, then that hypertension can be cured. But if there is any long standing, then it causes the damage to the interstitium by ischemia, then the blood pressure will not be curable even after the correction of the ischemia. So it may be asymptomatic or it may be symptomatic. So we have to have an early uh, diagnosis and we have invigilance and we need to do a Doppler studies to know what is happening to the uh, velocity and also the in intra Doppler uh, forms, which are basically an acceleration time and an RI, which depict the ischemia or the blood flow to the kidney. And so that we can treat it more effectively and early to prevent complications. The first report of renal artery stenosis was uh, published in NEGM in 1966 by a Massachusetts General Hospital, which were diagnosed after hypertension and the graft dysfunction, and they were treated it. So the multiple causes are there for a post-transplant hypertension. Most of them are contributed by the calcinute inhibitors, both the cyclosporin and also tacrolimus, and the cyclosporin Purin have more hypertension as compared to tacrolimus. The corticosteroids, which are used uh, in every patient, we don't use a corticosteroid sparing protocol till now. So they also lead to a lot of hypertension. And the transplant renal artery contributes to the hypertension in almost around 2 to 10% in different studies. So if they have a post biopsy uh, AVF malformation, then also there is a stealing of flow to the other areas. Uh, so that will be more in renin uh, release and the angiotensin increases and causes uh, blood pressure also. Then in the later stages, the chronic graft dysfunction causes and the native kidneys and the pre-transplant hypertension also will persist after the transplant. They're also contributing. So if you want to divide the hypertension into the immediate post-transplant, early post-transplant and the late post-transplant. So the uh, immediately post-transplant is the peritransplant hypervolumia the patient receives a lot of blood during the surgery, sorry, the volume by the surgery. So, uh, so the intravenous fluids, which are given almost around two to three liters, may lead to hypertension. And the steroid also given during the uh, uh, during the procedure. Uh, so, induction immunosuppressive agent, especially the steroid, almost to a tune of around one gram, which also causes the rebound hypertension because the pe uh, person may not receive the antihypertensive agents on the day of surgery and the inadequate pain control also contributes to it. Now, early post-transplant, the weight gain, which happens because they eat well and the calcium inhibitors, the steroids, the hypertensive donors, if they are there, 
they also contribute because when you are transferring a kidney from a hypertensive donor, even the recipient also may become a more hypertensive. Then the another most important cause is a treatable cause is a transplant renal artery. Stenosis is an important cause. Late causes of the chronic allograft neuropathy and once the obesity increases, they make the obstructive sleep apnea or the failed native kidneys and the sympathetic overactivity all contribute. So for a renal artery sten transplant renal artery stenosis, it's a most important curable form of refractory hypertension. Almost 75, it is contributes to 75% of the vascular uh, complications which we see in transplant. Incidence varies with definition and also the diagnostic techniques. And almost 12% of the Doppler uh, in an asymptomatic recipients, you may show uh, a transplant renal artery stenosis and it may confirm by the Doppler other techniques suspicion, then you may have it may reduce. The timing can vary, but most often it is in the around three to six months or within a year, almost most of the patients, but it can happen in even after around seven to 10 years when because of the atherosclerotic process. So usual presentation is around three months to two years, but again, it can happen anytime. The usual clinical manifestation is worsening of the refractory attention or an early onset of hypertension. The graft dysfunction in the absence of a rejection or an obstruction or an infection, it should we should have a clue whether we are dealing with a renal artery stenosis. So if the patient is getting an edema or the retention of fluid or complaining of a breathing difficulty and with increasing blood pressure, and we need to think that possibly a transplant renal artery stenosis has to be excluded. The paradoxically, the BP sometimes it may be normal or it may be lower. There may be rapid deterioration in the renal function after the diuretic therapy or an ACE inhibitor therapy, similar to what happens in the native kidney uh, trans, uh, stenosis. So most of the patients, some patients, they may be almost 10 to 15 percent, they may be asymptomatic and it may be diagnosed by a Doppler. And if there is any significant IRI reduction, we may have to intervene in these patients also. The risk factors is the technical error during the harvestation that causes an ischemia to the vessel or during the transplantation. The renal artery atherosclerosis is already there in the donor, which may progress after the transplantation and the steroid therapy. Neointimal hyperplasia, which can happen, or an accelerated atherosclerosis, which can happen by the immunosuppression. We all know that the steroids and also the calcium inhibitors, they increase the atherosclerosis process. It is a cytomegalo infection. It may cause uh, arteriopathy. They may also present with an throughout or it's a long stricture and the delayed uh, allograft function, which may happen, especially uh, people have seen more transplant renal artery stenosis in disease donor transplant because possibly there will be more ischemia and delayed graft function is seen. So. It may be a clamp injury. What are the etiologies? Some clamp injury to the donor or endothelium. Faulty sutural techniques by primarily seen in end-to-end -end anastomosis, especially in the internal iliacs. And the angulation is an important factor. And inadequate, especially if there is any inadequate length of a graft artery, then you may have an angulation which may lead to a hemodynamic and obstruction. The kinking of the renal artery, the disparity between the length of a vein and an artery, they may lead to kinking of the vessel and it may lead to a hemodynamic and stenosis later. The prolonged cold ischemia and the immunologically mediated uh, injury may also lead to diffuse stenosis. The atherosclerosis of the recipient, it may progress. So the, depending on the site, you may have a differences and at the site of anastomosis is most cops possibly because of the trauma to the recipient or during the harvesting or the clamping. Distal to the anastomosis, uh, um, uh, it can have uh, multiple atherosclerosis. And the distal to the artery, it may be a multiple stenosis is the expression of a chronic rejection process. Or the diffuse, it may be because of the immunologically mediated. How the hypertension develops? So it's on one kidney, it was almost behaves like a gold black uh, uh, one kidney, one clip model. The hypertension uh, is basically, but the kidney is denervated and the hypoperfusion does not directly elicit sympathetic overactivity. But there is a hypoperfusion which ha happens with a decreased size or a stenosis, which will result in the activation of the renin-utensin and the sympathetic nervous system. 
it leads to sodium retention and also the extracellular volume expansion. You all know that in the one clip, one clip model, there will be BP will be higher, renin will be normal in the later stages, and the volume will be high. As compared to the two clip, the BP will be higher, renin will be high, and the usually the other kidney will excrete the volume. So the volume will be normal in the two kid, uh, kidney, one clip model as compared to one clip and one kidney model. New steady state will be achieved as time passes and the hypertension is sustained in order to maintain the extravascular at the S, uh, at uh, increased extra uh, cellular volume and the renin becomes normalized. So the significant stenosis is said to be there in an experimental model when more than 50% of the lumen is, ex is occluded. Angiographically, even the uh, resistance vessels also increase and the perfusion to the function is maintained even up to 50%. When it is further reduces, there will be more and more hemodynamic instability. But again, if it is more than 70% perfusion uh, reduced or the occlusion happens, it is very, very significant. So the significant stenosis, it, it has happened to be there when the perfusion pressure drops to more than 15 millimeter of mercury. And the post resistance are also increased uh, so that it is maintains the GFR in the initial stages. But again, when the, G, uh, when the perfusion pressure is further drops or the stenosis is more than 70%, this is also taken away and then the GFR starts dropping. So removing the renal artery clip or the deobstruction at the early before the chronic ischemic changes happen in the kidney your hypertension can be cured and you may be free of antihypertensive agents if it happens uh, as a de novo hypertension so or the new onset hypertension so the kidney function also improves and the blood pressure also come back to the normal but if you diagnose it late then already in ischemic changes with, uh, in the interstitium that it won't come back to the normal we, what all we have to diagnose a trans, basically the plasma activity earlier people used to measure. It's a less informative in a unilateral or as compared to the native kidneys or in the transplant. Serum potassium, usually in the native kidneys it will be low because we're using calcineurin which are uh, causing high, uh, hyperkalemia. So it may be normal or increased because of that, because of the high, uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Renal scintigraphy, it may be good, it may be sensitive, it's almost 75%, but again, specificity is poor. So the color droplet is an important and reproducible. It was almost a sensitive, it's around 87 to 94%. Mind you, we should have a good radiologist to support you so that you can diagnose it early, what we have today. So the good specificity is also almost 100%. You can do a spiral CT or an MR or an angiography, which is a gold standard, but in a contrast media. But the advantage of an angiography is when you diagnose it, you can treat at the simultaneously with a stenting. Uh, so the ultrasound, it is an, uh, a very good tool and you need to do it even at, at least around two to five days after the transplant or one to two after the you know, weeks after the transplant and at three months to know what is the baseline of the vasculature and what is the velocity and what is an RI and the vacillation time so that it will act as a baseline parameter. The advantages of the main uh, uh, color Doppler is it's a non-invasive, it has high sensitivity and specificity, it is, can be bad, it can be performed and it, the follow-up it can be repeated. The main advantage disadvantage is the order latency. You should have a good radiologist to have a good color Doppler and to diagnose the renal transplant renal artery stenosis at the earliest. It is time consuming because of that, the multiple people, they may not do it more efficiently. If there's a multiple vessels and there is an anastomotic problem, then it is very difficult to say exactly which artery is involved. So the extra renal and the intrarenal Doppler findings, which will be conclusively telling us what exactly is happening. If there's a peak systolic velocity, it is more than two meters per second, then, and the velocity gradient, if it is from the iota to the vessel, is more than two times, and there's a distal spectral pattern, it's a broadening. So all these things will tell us in the basically that the blood flow to the artery is compromised. Possibly we are dealing with a transplant renal artery stenosis. The intrarenal doctor finds showing that the assumption time is higher, 
and the resistive indexes are less than 0.5, which means, and uh, so it will all show that um, uh, acceleration index is also lower. So it all shows that uh, possibly there is a slowing in the uh, uh, flow to the kidney after the uh, stenosis. So that is the reason possibly I uh, have to suspect a transplant in artery stenosis. So the only uh, 80, more than 80% reduction then will be uh, called as severe stenosis. So it is can be the full spectral window if it is there. It is more that it possibly there is a more than 50% and to severely disturb flow if it is there in the flow in the infrarenal, then possibly more than 70%. But again, it's again, it's an operator dependent and we have to be very careful. And the gold standard is after the uh, confirmation is only by uh, uh, angiogram. So what we see in an RR resistive index is the systolic minus the end diastolic divided by the systolic. It's normally 0.5 to 0.7. And the abnormal is more than 80% that shows that there is some interstitial fibrosis. But if it is less than 0.5, that means that the slowing of the peak or the flow into the graft is lower. So the length of the acceleration time, it's a length time in seconds from the onset to the peak, which will show us that it's a slowly peaking, then it becomes more. So uh, it is more than 0.12, then it shows that very, very slow and possibly we are dealing with. This is a uh, shown uh, pulses uh, uh, paradox pattern. Basically, Tardis paradox pattern basically shows that slow peaking wave, and you have to rule out a congestive heart failure in this situation to say that the possibly there is an associated transplantary renal artery stenosis. How to evaluate a patient who have a transplantary renal artery stenosis? If the person is suspicion or an hypertension rising or an edema and the abdominal brute, you can get a Doppler sound, ultrasound. If the peak velocity is more than 250, and then the ratio between the aortic and the iliac uh, is uh, more than 2 is to 1, and there's a high suspicion, then you need to do it uh, a digital subtraction angiography or a CT angiography uh, uh, to confirm it. And the digital subtraction angiography may be good that simultaneously you'll be able to treat. If the color Doppler is normal, then or an equivocal, then we'll have to think whether the GFR is good or not. Then we need to say uh, MR may, may, may be an option. So if it is normal, then we need to repeat evaluation has to be done. And uh, if there is any repeat rejection is there, it is, is there, we need to rule it out if there is any explanation and uh, Doppler findings are normal, then we need to do a transplant biopsy and rejection if it needs to be treated. So it has to be repeated at multiple times. When you diagnose a transplant renal artery stenosis, what all the modalities we have is a medical therapy, percutaneous therapy, and surgical intervention are the three main things. The medical therapy is uh, basically when the renal function is stable, and the Doppler finding shows that it is still less than two meters or less than 180 centimeter per second, and the resistive indexes are showing the RI is more than 0.3, which excludes the hemodynamic significant stenosis. So ACE inhibitor should not be used to control this hypertension in this situation. In more than 30% of the patient, the creatinine may go up when you have a renal artery stenosis and use ACE inhibitor and if it is significant. So other agents can be considered for a control of hypertension. We need to, when the ACE inhibitor, the uh, uh, creatinine goes up, we effectively will have to rule out is there any effective intravascular volume depletion or overgel of diuretics or hypolimunemia or decreased cardiac output which needs to be ruled out to conclude that the to rule out uh, associated these abnormalities, otherwise we'll con confuse with transferring lateral stenosis. The endovascular procedure, it's an indication in those who have hemodynamically significant stenosis and the presence of more than 10% peak systolic pressure gradient or 15 millimeter of mercury is uh, significant. And the treatment can be done by the transplant or angiography, or it may be a bare metal stent or the drug diluting stents, which can be choose depending on the patient. We usually use a bare metal stent so that uh, we can stop it uh, in the, any uh, biopsy or is required. So most often we use uh, a bare metal stenting. The percutaneous is the choice in, and uh, it should be evidence that the re can happen, but what we saw is only two, one case of re and one case of peace. So it's the re rate is low, it's 10%. And uh, the, it's a less invasive than the surgical approach. The
complication can happen. It is the renosis or the renal artery dissection and the thrombosis can happen. Thromboembolism can happen and the hematoma or the pseudoenerism at the function site you can have. So if you do a transplant renal artery stenting, you may have a lack any uh, uh, improvement or you may have an improvement. So it all depends how early you intervene, what are the what is the kidney function or the interstitial changes. So this intervention shows it's a lack of benefit in these studies, which I go don't go. It is all followed up for around three to three point five years, and another in seventeen months. They have shown that there is no significant improvement. But again, these are all the other trials which have showed a significant improvement right, in uh, by the Hinger et al. and the Peps et al. Pollack et al. which have shown the clinical that follow up after only three months. They have shown that there will be improvement or there is a benefit either in an improvement in the creatinine or any blood pressure. Surgical revascularization is an indication when it, the uh, stenting fails or the severe or the any stenosis and associated that if they're at the site of anastomosis, it may not be opening it or uh, if it is that they associated the uh, uh, aneurysm, then you may have to do a surgical technique. So the technique should include a resection and the revision of the anastomosis, either use a saphenous vein graft or the stenotic segment or an endectomy can be done. The higher rate of mortality and mortality is seen after the surgical technique because it is difficult to do surgery when you have used calcineurin inhibitors. The graft loss and the uretic injury and the mortality is almost around 5%. What is our experience? Uh, we had uh, almost around uh, 52 patients in, uh, uh, in those 1,366 uh, this is all the angiography we did and the uh, and the confirmed more uh, significant renal artery stenosis and uh, the age group was around 37 years and the gender predominantly were males and uh, so it, it's a uh, uh, donor's uh, age was around 46 the mean duration from the transplant was four months we had it in one week to 228 months so uh, living donors were uh, 56 and two disease donors. The diabetic was there in 23% and the peripheral vascular disease in 7% and the rejections where they seen in those patients prior to that, they are 13% had rejections and the anastomosis was predominantly an internal iliac. Uh, and uh, so in uh, from 19 to 20, uh, 1980 to 1990 transplant, we have one patient and it's serially, it was four and five in those five, five years, five, uh, in a, five years time, but again, 2016 to 2019, we had almost 26 patients, which amounts to around 5% of transplant renal artery stenosis as overall our experience of 1.64%. So at what time interval these patients presented? It is uh, three patients had less than one month. So a uh, 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 patient had presented within a seven days with uh, deep breathing difficulty and hypertension, and we had to intervene. And that's the earliest intervention we had. And uh, almost 19% uh, had uh, in one to two months. And then another uh, 14 patients had uh, what three to six months. And then the incidence goes down. And the highest and the largest we had was uh, in 228 months. So it is possibly the atherosclerosis which is progressing. What is the presentation? Almost 15, 60% of the patient had worsening of renal function and worsening of hypertension and the edema in 15% and uh, around 12% were asymptomatic and dyspnea was in 8%. What happened to the renal function after the intervention? So almost by uh, six months uh, from 1.8, it reduced to 1.3 and then stabilized. And uh, even there are only two patients at 240 months. So they were meant so the improvement was seen in almost around 50% and the stabilization was seen in 42% and it worsening was seen in 7.7%. Uh, so it was a very good improvement uh, in those patients. Otherwise, uh, uh, they were have a severe uh, stenosis. So even in the blood pressure, 20% uh, had normalized. So possibly we have intervened early and the BP is improved in 28.8% and uh, stabilized in 38% and worsened in 12% of patients. This is one of the diagnostic show the angiographic finding to show that there was stenosis and thinking and which improved after the stenting. The complications again, when you do any comp any surgery or any stenting, there will be complications can happen. Bleeding was there in three patients, and the stem thrombosis was seen 
uh, in one of the patients, and this was recently seen, and there was an aspergillus infection which predisposed to it. The 30-day mortality was there associated with an aneurysm. This lady we lost at within 30 days. The graft loss happened uh, later on. Uh, it's because in two patients, then the pseudo femoral pseudo aneurysm was seen, and we in, uh, injected a glue, and it improved. And the restenosis was seen in one patient. What are the other uh, studies? Uh, this was the thing by the yeah, CMC Bellor in presented in 2019. He had seen 543 patients, and in there, 43 patients had the transplant loss. This was the Doppler finding, and uh, it was amounting to 7.9 percent. And the most were uh, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, and almost 10 were uh, asymptomatic and erythrocytosis with all the things. And the early uh, within six months, there all uh, most of the people they presented similar to us. They had presented. Uh, early and the renal function also improved. This is the chart how they managed it. Those who have uh, only velocity or symptomatic, they followed up. Symptomatic, they underwent an angiogram. And uh, the high velocity with other features, uh, symptomatic, they did an angiogram. If there is any more than 50% uh, uh, stenosis, they they underwent an intervention. 11 patients, the angiography uh, 3 and stenting in 6. And the reimplantation was done too. And another, uh, by, uh, the HGPJ group, they found the vascular complications in almost around uh, 25 patients, that is 1.2, and two patients uh, were stented. And those the later uh, presentation, they were on the conservative uh, treatment. So, renal artery uh, uh, thrombosis uh, artery thrombosis was nine patients, and uh, so the renal artery stenosis was 11 patients, which amount to 0.58, and this was the time to peak. The, so the transplant renal artery uh, stenosis was in early as 49 days to as late as 8.5 months. So it can present from early to late. Early is more common. This is the page paper by the Rupnetti et al. After the intervention, the RI also improved and the peak velocity reduced and the GFR stabilized. To conclude, the transplant renal artery stenosis is not an uncommon, almost amounting to 1.52 uh, 5 percent. The graft dysfunction and the worsening hypertension are the main present conditions. It is not the curable hypertension if it's intervened early, needs early diagnosis and evaluation, and early treatment improves the graft function. Thank you very much. Thank and you, Mamati.